Hello, everyone. Here we are. Uh, move for a movement. I have Gracie Baruzzi and Azeb Fridis here today. Uh, Gracie is uh, the co founder and director of Nozama Dance Collective, which uh, has a central focus of empowering women through dance and the arts. And Azeb is a dance artist, artist in other forms in the Boston area. Uh, and she is the artist in residence for um, recent show, uh, collaboration of Nozama Dance Collective and Onstage uh, Dance Company, Empower One Another. Um, so that's a really key theme that I would love to touch on today, but we will see where it goes. So thank you so much to both of you for being here. This is Thanks exciting. Thanks for having us. This is awesome. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, it's actually the first, um, first double interview I've had like two with two, having two people so that's this is amazing. awesome happy to be yeah. the first so yeah on, on that note how did you two meet each other and come to work together um so as you mentioned uh along with the wonderful Jen of Onstage Dance Company I uh co-produce Empower One Another which is a performance series in which in the before, uh, we do collaborative rehearsals and pair up companies so that they can create totally new novel works about the themes of empowerment and just really share resources between the companies. We wanted to bring the dance community together in that way. And this year, we were all ready to go for our collaborative rehearsals. They started in early March. And as we all know, March threw some curveballs at us. And so we had to cancel all of our collaborative rehearsals and really refocus. Um, Azeb and Nozama were paired as collaborative artists for this year's Empower co cohort. So we already had the whole structure of the piece we were gonna start. We had the music set, we were totally ready to go, but we never got to have a rehearsal. And then we kind of took a pause to restructure Empower. We ended up making it a virtual show that couldn't incorporate more artists, so it was even better, but around May or so, I think, I reached out to Azeb because I'd been thinking, I was just like, I really wanted to work with this girl. Like, I have all these ideas swimming around and I really just want to collaborate with her. And I wonder if she still feels that way. <laughs> oh yeah. And then on that magic day, when Gracie reached out to me, I just happened to be in the best mood ever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, no, realistically, I was not even thinking about creating. I was really like low in the dumps of just kind of not being inspired. And Gracie reached out and said, hey, there's a lot going on right now. And I totally understand if you're in a space where you don't want to do that. Um, but I feel like especially because, you know, we were in the peak of being quarantined and there was so much going on around race and the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's where most of my um, artistic experiences with dance um, have been recently. And so for her to reach out and feel moved to want to do that kind of work, I was like, okay, then I should probably come out of the cave that I dug myself in and feel inspired to do something. So then we fell in love and here we are. Now yeah, we're in love. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that's really important. You know, I heard so many times and I try to embody in how I interact with colleagues and like check in on your black colleagues, you know, people of color that you work with, like put it in their hands, right? Maybe, maybe they need to be out there and do their work and fulfill their mission. Maybe they need to be in that hole, <laughs> as that's what you were saying. Um, and just, and which is like beyond understandable just to take that time and just like be right because of just the emotional weight of what was happening. So I think that's super important. And that sounds like that happened in a really healthy and productive way for everyone involved. It's a great model. Thanks. I really like wanted to reach out to Azza <laughs> to collaborate, mostly because we had planned to, and I was still really excited to, you know, share our creative voices. But I also definitely didn't want her to feel like. Nozama is, and we are very comfortable to say that we are a predominantly white appearing company. We have very few members of color. And so 
we want to, we wanted to use, we wanted to create work with, you know, the input of Azeb's incredible experiences, but not look to her and say, you have to teach us. Like, this is your responsibility now. This is a burden I am putting onto you. And so like, we talked a lot about how to work as, you know, collaborators on this project about that. And then how we integrated the company members into conversations around that, about how like, we wanted to learn from her, but not to place a burden onto her. So that was also something that was kind of in the back of my mind and still is. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and also, what was your role as uh, art, um, artist in residence? Because it can look different um, in different, with different companies and different situations. Um, what did you do as artist in residence, essentially? <laughs> right. So it's interesting because as we were working together, initially, we were just like, okay, cool. We're just going to do this project together for empower one another. We'll see how it goes. We'll feel the flow. Get going. Right. And then we kind of realized like, oh, we actually really enjoy working together. And I think it would make sense for us to continue working together after this series is done. Um, so Gracie and I were thinking of titles that would make sense for me to still work with the group. And the group never had an artist in residence before. So I thought that it would make sense for me to give myself that kind of title. Um, especially if we were going to continue doing projects together, right? So um, initially it was focused on becoming an activist part one. And then we decided that continuing this series of the allyship project um, should happen, right? So there's that. And then we found other ways um, for me to continue to be involved with the group um, outside of our part two that's coming. Amazing. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also curious. I alluded to the, a little bit, little bit of this before, um, Gracie, this idea of empower one another um, beyond the series, which again, this was mm -hmm. the second year that went virtual. Um, that's your company, right? And, and this, this mission of empowering women through the arts. Um, so I'm wondering how you're intentional about that and how you run your company and how you cast and programming and all that, how that actually happens within your company. Yeah, totally. So yeah, Nozama Dance Collective, our entire mission is, like you said, surrounded around the ideas of telling the stories of women in their daily lives in a way where we are speaking to the experiences of women in this current political and social climate and really telling the raw vulnerable stories of this of these women we felt like there are so many times where we hide our vulnerabilities as women that we don't always take hold of the incredible power that we have as women and so we wanted to tell stories as a company that talked about the spectrum of those that go from the, the ways that we celebrate one another as women, the trials and tribulations of being a woman. There have been many in recent history. Um, and so we kind of tell the spectrum of those stories. In running the company, it's therefore a collective and a collaboration in everything that we do. We are always talking about what's going to inform the concepts of the works that we're doing. Right now, we're working on a series of pieces that speak to the average day of a woman, specifically the things that she experiences but doesn't talk about. So mm -hmm. from beginning, the first, yeah, I'm excited. This is the compilation, we're calling it Today She Saw. We're gonna be doing a virtual performance in December of these works. The first piece being Monday Morning. It's a piece that my co-director, Natalie Sherrod, choreographed. It is all about the insecurities that you feel the moment you wake up and that you embody before you even leave the door to go to work, to school. Um, that's another really important part of my company. They're made up of all women who have, some of them, multiple full-time jobs who incorporate dance into their lives as um, something that enhances their lives, but they do not, you know, 
they make their money doing a multitude of other things, but it's important as adults to still have dance in their lives. Um, but yes, but today's She Saw is gonna be made up of pieces that speak to the things that we experience, but we don't always get to talk about and how as women, if we got to share those stories more, and many of us do, but if we spoke about them more and normalize them, that what could that world look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember listening to the Michelle Obama podcast. She's talking about just like something as mundane, but just like, wow, is menstrual cramps. Like, like, I'm, like about do, <laughs> do, do men even have any idea of like, she's like, it's like a knife is stabbing you over and over and you got to get up and go to work. And like, so when you were speaking about that, I, I was like, that moment listening to that podcast, it just struck me like, there are these things that they're just, uh, that are part of our experience that are just not talked about. And it's no one's fault that we experience these things. It's just biology a lot of the time, but sometimes mm -hmm. it is you know, patriarchy and all these other forces, but it's like, they're not talked about. <laughs> so hundred percent. It's amazing. I do also have to plug because this was a huge inspiration for our work. Um, the, not, the book, Text Me When You Get Home, it's the evolution of triumph of the modern female friendship. It's by Kayleen Schaefer. We are also working with her. It's a phenomenal book about like how female friendships have evolved, but more so it's this concept of text me when you get home. Like, why mm -hmm. do you tell your best girlfriends to text that to text you when they get home like they are completely competent wonderful women who can get themselves from a to b like you don't it's not that you're worried they don't know how to get home it's what is behind the thought process of text me when you get home what are the things that they are thinking about that could happen to their closest friend as they're just going home after a night out or home from work so one of the pieces that we're actually filming this Sunday and I'm in a very socially distant way outside um, is all around this idea that I have to have to plug this, this amazing author and book for because that was really the start of Nat and I wanting to focus on this body of work of like what women do for one another that we don't even always talk about. That's incredible. Could you say the author name? Yes, Kayleen Schaefer. Kayleen Schaefer. I will. Perfect. Great. I'm going to chat her to you. And Perfect. And share her with the world. Yeah. Wonders of Zoom. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, Zeb, I don't know if you get anything further to say on that, um, but I also wanted to ask you about, you do a lot of work with art and community. Uh, I do with sound and dance, and I, I was curious about how if it um, aligns or intersects with concert dance work, like how those things work in tandem. Um, are they kind of separate worlds for you? Do, do your work in each like sphere um, inspire each other? How do, how does that work for you? Definitely. I mean, I like to believe that art is intersectional, like most things, and mm -hmm. I. The beginning of my artistic career was with dance because, you know, I started when I was like three, did the whole tap jazz combo thing. Um, but then when I was in high school, I really wasn't taking it that serious um, just because I feel like I wasn't being taken seriously. So I started to dive into other forms of art. Um, I got involved with the marching band and then I played back on A. Um, and then I just kind Wait, of go like- go back, what do you mean? <laughs> Yeah, I played alto saxophone. No, 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 no. Gonna, before yeah. that. What do you what mean you I weren't think? taken seriously? Oh, well, I mean, I just kind of feel like... Oh, okay, cool. Um, I just kind of feel like, you know, I was in a dance school where I was often the only Black person. Um, I wasn't, like, seen to be, like... Mm -hmm put in the front or like put in multiple dances. And also that's a socioeconomic thing too, right? The ability to actually afford to take that many dance classes and to get your skills up, right? Um, but also like height, being tall, you're usually in the back or being um, a larger person when you're growing up and just kind of like your weight and how that's seen in the dance world. It's like, it's not really set up for you to be successful, quote unquote. Um, to prosper, right? So I felt very excluded in the dance world. And then when I graduated, I went to Simmons College, which is now Simmons University, and I was like, 
all right, where there's not really any like musical things going on here, but there's a dance company and I still very much wanted to dance. And I was thinking about how do I continue to be a part of dance um, in this like part of my life now, right? Um, and so the arts was always a big part of my life and I majored in arts administration. Um, and that's when I got introduced to arts education because at one point I wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't consider being a dance teacher. I just wanted to, you know, explore that. Um, and then at Simmons, I was able to have this space where I was like taken seriously and seen and I was able to choreograph my own work for the first time. Um, and that's when I was really able to see myself as an artist. Um, and then when I graduated, uh, before I graduated, I had internships at places like the Boston Ballet and the City Performing Arts Center, which is now the Box Center. And I was doing a lot of youth work um, for arts development with teens. And I still do do a lot of youth work. Um, and so now out in the real world, I've been looking for opportunities to be a part of the arts scene in Boston. And so when I was back home, I was living in Everett at the time, on stage dance company, was right down the street from where I was living. I was like, how did I not know that this place existed? Um, and I auditioned and I was there and I was like, this is awesome. Um, and I was really grateful to have another place where I could participate, right? Um, and I also just genuinely believe that like, even if you are the only person that looks like you, if there's at least one of you that will inspire another person who looks like you to show up and come through, you know? Cause it's like at Simmons, I was definitely one of three black people that were on the dance team, but I stayed because I knew that other people would eventually come because they saw me, you know? So sometimes being the first, it sucks, but <laughs> like you make it work for yourself and it's worth it in the long run. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that actually answered the question, but <laughs> that's kind of. I think I've forgotten what the question was, but that's, okay. that's fine. Um, no, I think, yeah, you were speaking about um, art and community. Um, I, I was asking about it. <laughs> um, art and community and concert dance and how those align for you. Oh, it definitely. Um, and I think you hit, yeah, I think you hit upon that about the ways you came to work in community and then, but this idea of like art, you know, <laughs> right? art um, was always part of you. And so those two forces are, are just always within you and it's kind of who you are and what you do. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's beautiful in a way, like stick to it so you can inspire other people who look like you. But another part of me like screams like that shouldn't be on you. Oh, you yeah. know, like, that's, like, so much of a response, like, that, that responsibility, that weight should not be on someone who is, like, the only or one of only three um, Black people or people of color in a certain community, right? So that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot to unpack, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we could probably talk about that for another hour, but. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, Gracie, a sort of similar question for you that, um, your work in pediatric nursing with um, pediatric oncology, it's just uh, like in the way you also work so hard with your dance company has always been super inspiring to me. Um, so oh, I'm thanks. wondering about for you, like how those two worlds intersect or how they don't, or like how do you, how do you make that work <laughs> in your life? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, so I um, I am a nurse at Boston Children's. I take care of kiddos who have hematologic and um, oncologic disorders. And so I've been there for almost four years and I've been running Nozama for almost eight. So I was in nursing school and running the company and I really found that once I had both, that I had like the two halves of myself. Um, I, my work is very much at the hospital. I am very lucky that I am able to be there and leave my work there. Um, it is, requires, you know, a certain level of focus mm -hmm. and a certain half of my brain when I'm there. But when I come home, I'm just me. And 
Nozama is kind of this all encompassing thing I'm always thinking about and always creating for. So they're interesting in that ways, but like the creative side, I feel like I've been able to inform because I have this particular job that requires a certain, certain things of me. And then, but if I didn't have that job, I don't think that I would have the appreciation for the arts the way that I do. Just the sheer break that I'm able to have in creating and having that outlet, um, especially for the last six months. I mean, I never stopped going to work. There was never a two week period that I was home or in any stretch of period of time that I went home. I went to work the day after they announced the lockdown. And it's been this, and I, my schedule never changed. My patient population never changed. The procedures changed, but uh, being able to have arts and the creation that we've had, even maintaining virtual rehearsals, even doing virtual productions, being able to have that outlet has been even more important through this whole thing. Um, but yeah, I don't really think I could do one without the other. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and everyone, you'll also see Gracie on like Instagram and her like, 6 a.m. workouts and I'm like <laughs> like not me <laughs> Bravo. that is that is a level of crazy that I'm happy to talk about but I acknowledge the crazy <laughs> uh, but like you know gotta be at work at 6 45 it's a weird life <laughs> it's a weird yeah. life. but no, I'm very yeah. very I'm very very lucky and I am um crazy <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm wondering also, question for both of you, um, this collaboration and finding other artists to work with and finding those meeting points where you come together and sort of talking out differences in opinion and all this, the, all the work that goes into working with other artists, um, which sounds like you both do a lot of, um, it's a lot, it's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what keeps you doing it. Um, what's fulfilling about it? What's special about it? What do you find most difficult and how do you address that? Uh, yeah, a lot of questions there, but anything, anything to that that you might want to speak, up, speak to? Yeah, I um, mean, yeah, go oh, for it. Okay. No, no, go for it, Aza. <laughs> I was gonna say, I feel like usually the things that prevent people from having like a good experience collaborating together is just the concept of clear communication and transparency right and so with Gracie and I like why it's worked so well is because we check in all the time like about everything and we're also just very transparent about what's going on in our lives like we check in on each other as people and as artists and to like make sure that you know we each have what we need to support each other to guide anything any kind of resources we can provide for each other like I just think those two things are so key you know if you have anything to add there, Gracie. Oh no, a hundred percent. Like we literally talked four hours ago. Like, yeah. and yeah. it's and it's been great because you know, for one thing, like I think there are many things that this entire experience since you know quarantine started that like we actually have gotten and the ability to be honest with each other and be like, look, like I need space, or I'm like. I need to engage or else I'm gonna like go crazy. Like I think that people are being more transparent with what they need as people. And that translates to how people are like working together. And it's definitely, I, th I think informed a lot of our collaboration. And I think one of the things that I, so for empower one another with pairing up companies, something that Jen and I really think about is like what each company is bringing to the table and what they're hoping to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And we, when we select the cohorts for the collaborative pieces, we really are looking for companies that want to learn from another company, that are looking to gain something from the other artist, that are not just coming in to be like, well, I mean, I guess we could do a piece with a bigger cast. Like, sure. Like, we, we're really looking for artists that were like, I really want to work with artists that will bring this to the table or who could teach us this. And so that mentality very much went into our collaboration with becoming an activist and allyship project because I wanted to, like I, I was looking to 
Azeb to help us to create work that like we would never have been able to without her perspective and her voice and her creativity and but we also I didn't come in being like I want it to be exactly like this so can we just do this like I think that sometimes with collaborations you go in and one one person or group is like okay well I want it to look like this so there's no room for flexibility or negotiation and I have seen some other partnerships where it's like Ooh, you can totally tell that like this person like ran it and this person showed up and they did not feel included or respected and it's like you don't want that mm-hmm. so I yeah, hope you didn't yeah. feel that way <laughs> yeah and then to go off of like your second half of the question Catherine of just like what is like do you find most beneficial from it I think what Grace even mentioned just like the source of creativity that can come from a collaboration and how special that piece or whatever it is that you're creating and powerful it can be because you're bringing two completely, not completely different, but at least like two different perspectives to create one thing that you wouldn't be able to do on your own as an individual, you know? Yeah, um, some of its parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I will say like going to the, the question about what's difficult about it, um, because honestly, it's like sometimes you just like find people and it just like clicks. Like when Nat and I met, it clicked. When Jen and I met, mm-hmm. it clicked. Azeb and I, it clicked. And I think the thing that has been, like you were saying, like being transparent and open communication are the pillars of all of those great collaborations. Uh, the tricky thing I think can be when it's just like, l- like logistics get in the way. And like, I feel like as the company director, I have to like, put the brakes on and I'm like I don't want to because I don't want to have to like think but like one of the things that I like juggle is like the schedules of my girls and like the like kind of where they are in their lives and what they need right now so and we'll talk about how we're working on part two but like Azeb and I were talking about the planning of it and I was like look like I gotta be super honest I think that to get the level of engagement that we want like this is not negative to any of my girls but I was like I think that we should do a smaller group because I think that some people are really you know that they need to take a break and so I think that we'll have a stronger group with this which like totally changed what I think you were thinking of um so sometimes it's just like those kinds of like frustrating logistics where you're like oh I feel like I'm like putting the brakes and I don't want to but setting setting the barriers it's hard (laughs) But you make it work, you know? You make it work. You make it work. Mm-hmm. You make it work. And less can be more. Less can be more. Less can be more. I think oh. it's going to be awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's going to be so good. <laughs> but yeah. And like I've, like there was, I think, again, like what can be difficult is like if one artist is coming in with like a very clear, but like just the like best conversations are the ones where you're like, I have this idea. Okay, yeah, that and this and then this. Yeah. And then by the end, you're like, yeah. Just we make a lot of noises on our call. Yeah, a we, of like, there's Ew! a lot of screaming. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of that. <laughs> but I also I have a couple more benefits yeah, go of with the working benefits. together. Um I just I just have so many ideas here. We're here, guys. Um so other benefits here are that you're bringing two audiences together, not just two artists. Yes. You know, like you are really empowering one another. Um, (laughs) and just like uplifting each other's work, you know, you're more likely when you work together and it's a successful partnership to recommend that other people go to that person's show or other people go check out whatever else they have going on, or you're more likely to want to work with them again or recommend other artists to want to work with them. You're just kind of generating a stronger arts and dance economy in the community in general by doing that, you know, exactly why we created empower one another, like exactly we wanted to bring well the the number one thing that we wanted to do was to bring company directors together to realize that they are not in this alone that Mm -hmm. running a company is hard that running that being an artist is hard that being someone navigating the dance community alone is impossible so we wanted to bring artists together and share these resources and not feel like you're in the bubble of your own group or company or tiny little circle that like, especially now, we were talking about this for the Q&A from Empower One Another last weekend where 
we are now completely overhauling the way that we view rehearsals, that we view productions, that we view individual works. And in order to get to the other side of this, we're going to have to work together. We can't be mm -hmm. fighting over money. We can't be fighting over who gets the stage, whatever that may be. Right. And so we need to work together. And that is also where exactly what you said, Azeb. It's like, we, if we are all working together, like Empower One Another brought together 14 artists, many of whom had never been in a show together. And the audience included all of their networks who then saw those artists that they hadn't seen before. They saw their names. They saw the collaborators. It was awesome. Like mm -hmm. literally the most like incredible compliment I've ever, ever, ever gotten being the director of Nozama was when I was at Nachmo, uh, which was back in January. It was the last time we performed in person and somebody came over mm -hmm. and said, and introduced themselves and said, my dad always gets really excited when he knows Nozama's performing. I was like, uh -huh. that is like the stinking sweetest thing ever. Also because it was their dad. And I was like, yes, like yeah. <laughs> it was just awesome. But like, getting everyone to like see each other's work and like I always get excited when I see new people performing yeah All the good things. you know we, we need the support for the arts more than ever and you know the shows that sell out are studio their studio recitals because, <laughs> because everyone's like parents and cousins and um so to generate that support for the arts coming from supporting each other is going to be huge. Um, and you're, you and Jen are the, the pioneers. <laughs> I just didn't feel like anyone was like working together. And, yeah. it, and I feel like in the last two years, it has just, I don't feel that way anymore. And I really felt that way more than two years ago. I felt like I was just like muscling it alone with Nat. And that we were just like, how are other companies making it work? What are we missing? And yeah. I don't feel that way anymore. It's awesome. Yeah, the, you know, it doesn't have to be this suffering alone, right? Like, oh, it's so hard. We don't have any money. Like, I frankly see, and I understand it, a lot of artists, dance artists, choreographers, etc., putting out there on Facebook, like, this is impossible. And I get it. I'm like, yeah, you know, this capitalist society does not support the arts like it should. Um, but the other side of that is like, how can we work together to overcome that inherent challenge? Mm -hmm. And in the end, support the arts out there, you know, more, more than they mm -hmm. would be. So that is all amazing. Um, yeah, so... I think you were starting to speak a little bit more, Gracie, about part two of the Allyship Project. My next question is really, like, what are you guys doing that we can know about, that we can support, that we can engage in um, out there for the audience? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that project, you can speak about more. Anything else? And you too, of course, Azeb. Azeb, tell us about part two. Well, then. Um, well, tell us about a little more about part one and then part two. Yes. I'll tell you everything, okay? Um, so, so part one of becoming an activist in allyship project um you know we kind of saw part one as this like awakening in a sense but also just coming into the idea of like all right let's look at the context of the world we are all trapped inside of our homes we are all being saturated with new information every day and not the best information. You know, we're hearing about like people being murdered in the streets by the police, you know, every freaking week, day, second minute, etc. And you know, that's really heavy shit. Sorry if I'm not allowed to swear. Um, but essentially, <laughs> video is marked not for children. It's all good. <laughs> essentially, you know, given that context, right, of this is something nobody has ever experienced before at this level. Um, we really wanted to, like, capture that. And I feel like that's what we did. And so we wanted to capture it from this perspective of, you know, we're 
working, I'm working with mostly white women and I'm the only black person here. So like the way that I'm experiencing this is slightly different than how they're experiencing this, right? And so the allyship aspect is like, how can you be an ally or how can you start to think about being an ally in this time? So that was part one. We hope that we were able to demonstrate small ways that you could reflect, engage by voting, um, and just genuinely oh. be a compassionate person to Black people and other people of color in this time period, right? So part two um, is going to address how do we sustain this work? How do we keep doing it? You know, what do we do when the protest is over? What do we do when we're done reading our book? Do we share that knowledge? I hope so. Um, so what we hope to do in this like second part is addressing examples and just feelings in general of how to get through those pain points of being an ally um, and the challenging aspects of it that may be daunting to you to actually doing and continuing the work because the work don't stop, fam. It do not stop ever. Mm -hmm until it's done, but it ain't yeah. done. Nothing. Yeah. And just, just to add a little bit of context, just from something I've read, um, there's this really thought-provoking piece in The Atlantic, just really urging, like, don't let this be a moment, because if George Floyd's death wasn't enough, because there was some polling that um, support for Black Lives Matter amongst white people in this country had started to go down. And the author was just saying, like, that's a really disturbing trend because we see this over and over again, this cycle of, like, outrage at police killings, police brutality, um, and then it goes down, and we don't actually get the change we need. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that second part is really so crucial of, like, okay, what now? Yeah. So that's, that's really wonderful to hear, um, that important focus. And we will be – so we premiered – Becoming an Activist and Allyship Project in Empower One Another. We're going to be releasing it for general audiences on our, on Nozama's YouTube page. I believe we're going to release it on November 1st, which is pretty timely, given what will happen two days later. And then we'll be releasing part two um, a couple weeks after that. So, Woo! very excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know the word November is overwhelming. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, what happens two days later? And I'm like, exciting, exciting, exciting. Exciting <laughs> thing. Uh, will part one be up on YouTube as well, along with that? Or is it already? Yeah, up? so part one, one we're going to release November 1st as to, for, our, for our larger audiences. And then part two will come a couple weeks later. Got it. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. We're going to be using part one kind of as a nice reminder because as Azab said, we it, throughout the piece touch upon some pretty crucial things that we can be doing to be better allies, number one of which is voting. 100%. Mm -hmm. I got my so mail-in ballot today. If you're, not registered, if you're not registered yet, I'm probably speaking to the choir, but it's right, yeah. you can find your state guidelines. Do it, do it, yes. do it. The Daily did an amazing episode today about all of the guidelines. They went through every single state. So if you listen, you can find out exactly what your state is doing. If you're confused at all, it is, it is a great timely episode. I just hear like Michael Barbaro soothing website, like we're going to list them all and you're going, to, listen. You're going to listen. <laughs> He's like, this is what we're going to hear every state. I was like, yes. <laughs> um so vote 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 amazing, amazing create thing. dance and vote because we can only make change together and storytelling in the body is a powerful way to do it cough cough yeah. <laughs> we're excited yeah yeah so i think that's about what i have if either of you either both have parting things to share with our audience yeah, well, I mean, this is the, actually the first time that I'm sharing this with anyone in a more public way. So you will be the first person to know this. As of 2021, Nozama Dance Collective has a new artistic director. We are passing the leadership on to Dana Al-Samsam, 
it was a really beautiful uh, paths crossing of being the right time for Natalie and I to step down as artistic directors and the perfect time for Dana to come in and to inject her incredible voice. And she has immense experience with, uh, with grants, uh, with grant applications and with fundraising and she understands arts organizations from the inside out. She has also been a dedicated member of ours for years. So Natalie and I will be staying on as founding directors and providing guidance through the 2021 season, but Dana will be taking over. So the December performance that I mentioned is actually going to be the last one that Nat and I are the artistic directors for. Mm -hmm. So we will be making this a little more public in the coming month or so. Uh, but it's really exciting because I was talking to Azeb earlier about how, you know, with the change of leadership for Nozama, that beyond part two, that she'll really be owning, becoming an activist as her project that she will be working with other dancers for to continue the work and so Nozama dancers will of course love to be included but but yeah oh and the thing that I'm really excited for is that I am staying on as a co-producer of Empower One Another so I'll be working with Jen to really amplify and broaden that entire project so I am not leaving the dance community by any means I'm just no longer going to be the artistic director of Nozama. Mm big change. <laughs> I've been doing amazing work and I'm Thanks, sure you will continue lady. to do Thank so. Thank you. Got a lot, you know, personal life things made this the right time for a lot of reasons. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's, I'm excited to see, um, I'm excited to support a lot of companies in a lot of different ways and find a new role in the dance community. It's going to yeah. be awesome. Yeah. yeah. And Go right ahead. That's weird though. <laughs> I know. It's weird, but I'm really excited. And Dana is like going to be above and beyond phenomenal. I'm so excited that we have her. Yeah, Nozama will still be run by a ginger. It's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> ginger life. That was not part of the application process. Oh my goodness. Wait, Catherine, are you ginger too? Somewhat. Strawberry. Hey, oh. Strawberry. <laughs> That's amazing. My, my hair color depends on how much sun I've gotten, really. I see. <laughs> um, but yeah, so obviously, Gracie, we're all immensely grateful for your contribution to the arts world in Thanks, Boston, lady. for real. Because without you, we wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be here right now. Um, oh, stop. <laughs> until you know. Um, but I do have some things that I'm doing outside of part two. Um, so I run a podcast as well yeah. with my brother. It's called the Freitas Effect Podcast. You can find us on all of the streaming devices except for YouTube because we have not done that yet. Um, <laughs> but if you want to follow us on social media at the Freitas Effect at um, on Instagram at TFE Pod on Twitter and wherever if you just look up our name on Facebook like us. Um, give it a gander. We talk mostly about like mental health stuff. Sometimes we talk about the arts world um, and just kind of navigating life right now as young adults. Um, and I think we're funny. So if you want to <laughs> just want to laugh. Yeah, send us those handles and, and we'll yeah. follow. I'll send those over. Um, yeah. And then um, I'm also working on this movement that I think is really important called Create For Me. And essentially, I was inspired to start this movement because I felt like a lot of my friends were, are like artists or in the creative scene or kind of just like creating for commission and feel pressured by like capitalism to like have to create to make money. But also like there's a joy and there's a healing that comes with just creating for yourself and for the sake of creating. And also I just wanted to inspire other people who have been intimidated of entering the arts world and getting in touch with their creative side to like pursue it because it's like obviously at first you might not be great at it but with practice comes greatness right so um hashtag create for me follow me on instagram at azeb a-z-e-b three underscores um and i'll be posting stuff you can post stuff use the hashtag um and i'll share it because we need to inspire everybody else to hop on board with them <laughs> love Beautiful. it 
beautiful. All right, we'll get all of that out in notes and people will follow and support. I hope. Please, people, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, again, thank you so, so much um, for meeting with me today. I think we talked for a while. <laughs> We're gonna talk longer. Um, yeah, everyone, please like, subscribe, follow and support our two lovely ladies here. And we will talk to you soon. Thanks, Catherine. It's for justice, change for change, move for people. Woo! My Thanks pleasure. You. Happy Thursday, everyone, or whatever day Happy you're watching. Happy Thursday. Enjoy your weekend. Back at you. Go out and vote. Heck yeah. Woo! B O T E. <laughs> <laughs>